a strange question for you. Are you a cave person? And what I mean by that is, are you the kind of person, if you have the opportunity to explore a cave, are you the kind that would say, yes, I would love to do that. I can't wait to get in there, you know, poke around, uh, see if there's maybe some hidden treasure or something like that. Or are you the kind of person, like most people, that would say when it comes to caves, no thank you. Why in the world would I want to go underground in some dark, uh, smelly cavern where there are mountains of earth on top of me that could crash, come crashing down at any time? Well, I have to admit, when it comes to caves, I, I kind of have mixed feelings. And I think it goes back to a time when I was a kid and we were camping at the Mount Lassen uh, forest near some of the, the lava caves up in that area. And I remember I loved it. I loved the excitement and the thrill of, you know, exploring deeper and deeper into these caves and it would get darker and darker and, you know, the, the stale smell. I just loved the whole thing. But I remember one time uh, as a kid, I have two older brothers. Brothers. Um, and my two older brothers, I'm the youngest, my two older brothers were going to take us, take me exploring down in this, um, this one cave. And I don't know what it is about older brothers that they are just apparently pre-programmed to torture and scare their younger brothers. And that's exactly what my brothers did on this occasion. We went down and we, you know, started winding our way down and it got darker and darker until finally the, the light from up above was all gone. So it was dark and, and we'd been wandering around long enough that I think I was starting to kind of get turned around a, a little bit and there as we were in that dark my brothers decided that it would be a great time to try to scare to death their younger brother and so of course as the older brothers they both had the flashlights and they decided that they would turn the flashlights off and hide from me and I still remember just how pitch dark it was and, and I could remember the panic sweeping over me as the darkness came in and I could almost feel the walls of the cave pressing in on me at that time. And do you know what I did next? Well, I'll tell you about that in just a little bit. But I bring all that up because we are in a study of the life of King David. It's called Chasing After God's Heart. And today's message is all about David's cries from inside a cave. And, and today we come to really one of the lowest periods in all of David's life when he is forced to deal with feelings of panic and darkness and depression and despair and I don't know if you've ever had some of those times when it feels like the walls are just closing in on you. That's what David was feeling at these times. Now, if you've been following our study, you may be surprised about that because when we just left David last week, we saw that David was really at a high point in his life. In fact, in our first two weeks, we've seen two really uh, amazing times uh, that have been kind of high points for David. First of all, very surprising, in 1 Samuel chapter 16, uh, God chooses David and uh, the prophet Samuel anoints him to be the future king. Not because of David's size or strength or anything, but by God's grace. And it reminds us of the way that God sees us and by his grace, he calls and anoints us as well. And so David is anointed as the future king of Israel. Then in chapter 17, maybe even more surprising than that, David is supposed to be out tending sheep in the desert and he ends up doing battle with the Philistine champion named Goliath. And David defeats this giant and he saves the nation uh, from their enemy and the crowd goes wild and everybody loves David and it's like he had reached this high point in his life. In fact, when you get to 1 Samuel 18, which is where we're really picking up the story today, it's as if uh, everything couldn't be going any better for David. It seemed like whatever he touched turned to gold. Uh, he was given this great job as a commander in King Saul's army. He'd been uh, Saul's musician, but now he becomes a commander in the army. And as a national hero, he's exempted from all taxes, which is just an amazing thing. Um, King Saul's son, Jonathan, befriends David and they become close best friends. They even enter into kind of this covenant relationship that they will always be there for one another. David marries King Saul's daughter, Michal, making him uh, the king's son-in-law. On top of that, all over Israel, uh, David is so popular that he actually has his own theme song. It's kind of like today at a, a baseball game when a player comes up to bat, they have kind of their walk-up music. Well, everywhere that David went, we're told that actually he had this theme song and all of the women would come out when David came around and they would dance and they would sing this same song. It was the number one song on all the charts and it went like this. Saul has struck down his thousands, but David, David has struck down his tens of thousands. 
So how good did David have it? 1 Samuel 18 verse 14 actually says this, In everything, in everything he did, he had great success because the Lord was with him. I mean, wouldn't you love that to be true about you? How'd your week go? Well, in everything I did, I had great success. Well, that's the way it was for David. Everything he did was coming up roses. And then suddenly the bottom falls out. In fact, the very next verse, 1 Samuel 18, 15, is an important one uh, in David's life because what we see is this. It says, when Saul, who was the king at that time, when Saul saw how successful David was, he was afraid of him. Some translations say that Saul dreaded David or uh, despised David. Because after all, you heard the song, right? David kills his tens of thousands. Saul only kills his thousands. And so something happens to David that sometimes happens when a person experiences success. The other people around start to get kind of jealous of that. And in Saul's case, he becomes obsessed, obsessed with this rage towards David. In his jealousy, uh, Saul actually tries to kill David. He throws his spear at him, tries to pin him to the wall. And all David can do is run for his life. In fact, in the next four chapters, if you want to sum up chapters 19 through 21, it's with this phrase, David fled and escaped. That's what we see time and time again. Six times in the next four chapters, we read that David was on the run. He fled and escaped. He fled and escaped. Everywhere he went, he had to go on the run. In fact, in the next few chapters, if I just sum it up real quickly, we talked about all those things that had happened for David. Slowly, one by one, he starts to lose all of these things. First of all, he loses his job and his possessions now that Saul is, is chasing him. He, he loses that security and that great promotion that he'd experienced. Next, he loses the security of his marriage. Um, Saul comes to looking for him and his wife, Michal, helps him and, and actually rescues him at the time and it's really great. Um, but then Saul comes and questions her and she kind of sells David out at that point. And a lot of times when a marriage hits a, a crisis or a crisis point, they can draw together, or come closer, uh, but sometimes it'll push them apart. And in this case, they are allowed to be pushed apart and David and Michal never really are quite in unity together. And in fact, family is kind of a constant struggle for David from this point um, forward. He loses the security of his, his mentor, Samuel, um, is just not able to be there for him in the same way while David's on the run. Even his close friendship with Jonathan uh, is so stressed because even though Jonathan helps him escape at one time, uh, eventually even that friendship is lost and they'll never see each other alive again. In fact, how low does David sink? He's been to the top of the mountain and now he's tumbling down. How low does he sink? Check out this scenario in 1 Samuel, or, uh, 1 Samuel chapter 21, and he's on the run and David runs to the city of Gath. Now, if you've been following along, that name may sound familiar to you. He goes to Gath. You remember, we've met someone else who's from the city of Gath. You remember who it was? That's right, it's Goliath. Gath is actually one of the Philistine cities and one of the Philistine capitals. And so David decides he's running from Saul. He says, I'll go to this Philistine city. Saul will never look for me there. Problem is he goes to Gath. Right away, the people recognize him there. They'd heard the song about David killing his tens of thousands. And they say, this is the guy that killed our champion Goliath. And so now you've got Saul and his men chasing after David and closing in on him from one side. And you have the people of Gath clothing in on David from the other side. And so what does David do? He plays the old fake like you're insane trick. This is what we actually read in 1 Samuel 21, 13. How bad had things gotten for our hero David? It said he pretended to be insane in their presence. And while he was in their hands, he acted like a madman, making marks on the doors of the gate and letting saliva run down his beard. And it turns out that, that ancient people, many ancient Near Eastern uh, cultures, actually thought that insanity was contagious. And so David is allowed to escape. But friends, think about what's happened in these last few chapters. He's lost his friends. He's lost his job. He's lost his wife. He's lost his safety. He's lost his mentor. And now it feels like he's hit bottom as he's lost his dignity. If he lost his dog and his pickup truck, David would be living the worst country song of all time. But the point is, David has nowhere else to turn. And I just wonder, have you ever been there? Have you ever been there where it feels like everything you're doing turns out wrong, right? Any, anyone ever feel like no matter what you try, 
it never works. It's just one closed door after another. What do you do in those times of despair, those times of depression? What do you do in those times of darkness when it feels like things are closing in on you and you have nowhere else to turn? Well, we know where David turns. David turns in 1 Samuel 22, 1. It says this. It said, David fled and he departed from there, from Gath, and he escaped to the cave of Adullam. That's right, things get so bad that David decides to go hide underground. And this is what is sometimes called David's cave time. And here's the thing about the story of David and this whole idea about chasing after God's heart. We talked about this last week and we said if you were a kid and you were ever learning stories from the Bible and maybe you had a children's Bible or a Bible comic book or a, you know, a Bible video as a kid or something like that, if you had any of those things, I can guarantee you that the story of David and Goliath was in there. And I can guarantee you that the story of David's cave time was not in there. Why? Because we love the story of victory, right? We love the, the wins. We don't know how to handle the losses. And yet here's the thing, as you think about the life of David, the, the story of David and Goliath is super important and a great story, but it represents one day in the life of David, one day. Most scholars will tell you that David's cave time lasted up to seven years, but we never hear about those times. And I love what Renee Scheffler, the pastor at, uh, uh, that wrote the book, Chasing David, we're kind of following uh, his series um, uh, through this study. This is what he says about it. He says, when we only tell the positive and encouraging stories from the Bible, we paint an unbiblical picture of life and it messes people up. If we only tell the good times, if we only tell the happy times, it's an unbiblical, it's not a realistic picture, it's not a biblical picture, and it messes people up, right? Because if 2020 has taught us anything, it is that life is full of ups and downs. 2020, 2020 has taught us so many times that there are so many things that are beyond our control, just things that we can't control. And listen carefully, this is so important. As Christians, uh, we have got to be able to learn to be real and honest about these hard times, these times when things are difficult, these times when things don't make sense, these times when things feel dark. In fact, in recent years, um, we've heard different, you know, Christian celebrities or different Christians that maybe you've known that some of them just walked away from faith. And it's always so heartbreaking. But one of the things you'll hear from people is, you know, I was following God and then something bad happened in my life and I didn't know how to explain it. Or I had a question about something. I had a doubt about something. I had a question about the Bible. I had a question about the church. I had a, uh, something bad that happened in my life and I was not equipped to deal with those things. And so some well-intentioned Christian came along and just gave a trite and a simple pat answer that said rather that, you know, said this is just, you know, some simple thing, rather than embracing the truth and the reality that there are hard things that happen in life. And there are doubts and there are questions and there are times when we are in a cave and God is there. In fact, I love what the great theologian Mike Tyson said. Mike Tyson said it like this. He says, everyone's got a plan until you get punched in the mouth. And David had been punched in the mouth. But here's the thing, and you've got to know this. You see, God was with David in the good times. When Samuel, surprise, surprise, anoints little David as the king, God is with him. When David charges towards the giant and he throws that stone, God is with him. And when David is alone in the cave in despair, God is with him. We have to get past this thinking that says God's blessing comes to me in good circumstances. I only know that, that God's blessing is there when, when everything is going well for me. We have to come to understand that God's blessing is tied up in his nature and his unchanging goodness. Right? God's blessing is not everything's happening well for me. God's blessing is that he is God and he is good. And that does not waver when my circumstances change. It doesn't waver when my mood changes. And so when hard times come, I don't have to leave the faith because I've never been equipped for doubts and struggles. 
but I can lean into my faith even when God seems absent. And that's what David does in his cave time. And that's what sets David apart. We're talking this whole series about chasing after God's heart because there's that description of David, who's a man after God's own heart. And one of the reasons why is he recognizes that even in those times, he can lean in to God. He doesn't have to turn or run away. So what does David do in these times? How does David feel as he's in these seasons? What is he thinking when his world is falling apart? Well, what's great is we actually don't have to wonder what David is thinking because he wrote those words down for us. In fact, what I wanna do for the rest of our time together is I wanna walk you through three Psalms that we see that David wrote, two of them specifically from in this cave. Uh, where David wrote, and he describes how he's feeling. And another one that we see was actually at a time after he had uh, pretended to be insane. And so what I'm going to do is I want to give you just a little simple glimpse from three different Psalms from this period in David's life. It's my hope that you'll actually read the whole Psalms and dig into these a little bit on your own. But I want to look at three Psalms from this time. And what I want to see is kind of a progression, if you will, starting with David on his face in his time of difficulty on his face in humility, crying out honestly to God. Then we see that David kind of moves to his knees and he's declaring that God alone is his refuge. And then finally we see he's able to make it to his feet and to praise God in even the darkest times. So three Psalms from this season of David's life, the cave times, starting with Psalm 142, where we see this. It actually says, a song of David when he was in the cave. And it's a prayer. And he writes this. I cry aloud to the Lord. I lift up my voice to the Lord for mercy. I pour out before him my complaint. Before him, I tell my trouble. When my spirit grows faint within me, it is you who watch over my way. In the path where I walk, people have hidden a snare for me. Look and see, there is no one at my right hand. No one is concerned for me. I have no refuge. No one cares for my life. No one is concerned for me. I have no refuge. No one cares. Aren't those pretty shocking words coming from one of the great heroes of the Bible? This is David the warrior, David the worshiper, David the future king. But this is David at the end of his rope. And yet what David does, again, as I said, is something that sets him apart as a man after God's own heart. Because in his distress, he gets honest. He gets real. And he cries out honestly to God. He bears his soul and he doesn't hold back. Look at some of those words in in those verses that we just read there. David says, I cry out, I plead, I pour out my complaint. I tell you of my troubles. You know, I could learn a lot from David's honesty, and I wonder if you can too. Because sometimes I know for me, it just feels like I need to be so polite in my prayers or so proper in my prayers, as if God doesn't know my true feelings to begin with. But the truth of the Bible is this. All of the spiritual giants prayed honestly. All of the spiritual giants cry out to God. Jesus himself, it says, sweat drops of blood as he cried out, God, help me. I don't want to go through this suffering, right? I mean, that is intense. That is real. I love what author Philip Yancey says in his book, Where is God When It Hurts? He says this, As the Bible clearly shows, God has a high threshold of tolerance for what is appropriate to say in a prayer. I love that. God's threshold is pretty big when it comes to to what you can actually say to him in a prayer. Why? Because God can handle my unsuppressed rage. I may well find that my vindictive feelings need God's correction, but only by taking those feelings to God will I have the opportunity for correction and healing. And so you can be honest with God. And I think one of the things that sets David apart is his willingness to be honest. He doesn't hold back. He lays it all out there. He says, God, where are you? God, I feel deserted. I feel alone. There is no one here for me. I am at a low point. God, I cry out to you. And here's what I love. And and this is true for us. When we're willing to express those things, when we're willing to cry out, that's that first step to beginning to work through that stuff. 
And what we see is David begins on his face, crying out honestly to God. But after he does that, it allows him to kind of move to the next step in the process, which I want to say is David on his knees, where he realizes that God alone is the only thing that he can hold on to. God alone is his only refuge. Uh, the next psalm that we see is Psalm 57. It's also uh, written, it says, a psalm of David. It's to the, th to the tune, so we know it's a song of do not destroy. It says, it it is when he had fled from Saul into the cave. And verse 1 says this, Have mercy on me, my God. Have mercy on me. For in you I take refuge. I will take refuge in the shadow of your wings until the disaster has passed. Verse 5, Be exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let your glory be over all the earth. Verse 9, I will praise you, Lord, among the nations. I will sing to you among the peoples, for great is your love, reaching to the heavens. Your faithfulness, it reaches to the skies. So be exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let your glory be over all the earth. And the application here is that David comes to understand, even while he's in a cave, that he can run to God as his refuge. But for David, he had to get to this point. He had to get to this point where everything else had been stripped away, everything else had been pulled away, and he didn't have anything else here on earth that he could turn to. And after he had lost everything that seemed important to him, every relationship he counted on, every possession he counted on, every great job, every, you know, theme music about his own life, every, you know, piece of popularity. When all those things were gone, David could recognize that the only thing that would really last is, God, you are my refuge. God, I hide myself in the shelter of your wings. This phrase refuge is something David uses 40 different times in his writing. He understands that in times of distress, he can find God as his refuge alone. Well, uh, what happens next with David when he's in the cave? To me, it's almost comical. Because back in 1 Samuel 22, we read this. It says, David goes and he hides in the, the cave of Adullam. And it says uh, this. It says, after that, this is what it, it comes next in, in verse 1 of 1 Samuel 22. It says, when his brothers and all his father's house heard that he was hiding in the cave, they went down there to him. And David's got to be thinking, great, my family shows up. Because I don't know about you, but when you're in a time of distress, you're in a time of depression, do you want to be with a big crowd of people or would you rather be alone? Most of us would rather be alone. But here shows up David's brothers and his family. And if you remember, specifically, David's brothers had really been a jerk to him through all of, all of that we've read so far. And so suddenly his brothers show up. Great, he thinks. But that's not the end. It also says, and everyone who is in distress and everyone who is in debt and everyone who was bitter in soul gathered next to him in the cave. And David has to think, oh, lovely. Like every misfit, every, you know, every high maintenance person in the whole region suddenly comes and joins David in the cave. And can you imagine how that felt to, you know, here he say he's struggling and now he's got all of these people gathered in around him. I did a little research on, on some of these people that, that came and joined David in the cave. The, the Hebrew word for those in distress, it's the word zuk. It refers to someone who's under great pressure or stress. And the people that were under great stress came and joined David in the cave. Uh, everyone is in debt refers to people who are on the run from a number of different creditors, people who owed many people. And that group came and joined David in the cave. And finally, there it says those, those that were bitter in soul. Uh, it refers to those that are discontented, those that had been wronged, those who had been mistreated so that their very souls hurt. And this is the cheerful group of people. These are the ones that joined David in the cave. And it feels like things went from bad to worse. And yet we know that God isn't looking for perfect people. God is looking for honest people and real people who are going to cry out to him, who are going to get from their face onto their knees and recognize that God is his refuge. And as I thought about that picture of all these people crowded together in that cave and all of the problems and all of the discontent, honestly, to me, it's a perfect picture of the church. And in this year where we're talking about we, the church, this is a great picture because if we're honest, some of us are discontent and some of us are under distress and some of us are on the run and some of us are in debt. And we can be honest to God and we can be honest to God together. 
And here's what happens. God can take even a group like that and make something special and make something beautiful. In fact, what we read is that 400 men that crowded into the cave with David on that time have eventually become known as what? They become known as David's mighty men. God can take something messy, and when people surrender themselves to follow after him, God can do something mighty among them. And God wants to do that in your life, and God wants to do that in your family, and God wants to do that in this church. But it starts with the posture of David. God, I cry out to you from my face in humility. And God, from my knees, I recognize that there's nothing else that I can hold on to. You are the only one that will give me purpose. You are the only one that will last. You are my refuge. And here's what's great. He moves from his face to his knees, and eventually that gives him the strength to move to his feet, where we see that he praises God even in the darkest time. The last psalm uh, actually is from Psalm 34. It's it's, uh, when David pretended to be insane, and he says this, I will extol the Lord at all times. His praise will always be on my lips. I will glory in the Lord. Let the afflicted hear and rejoice. Glorify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. Verse 8 says, Taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is he who takes refuge in him. So those are really powerful words from David, you know, words of praise, especially when you think about the context, right? And everything that we know that's going on in his life and all of the things that he's lost and all of these 400 people gathered uh, around him all at the end of their rope for them to be able to cry out to God in worship. And yet that's one of the, the great reasons why, honestly, we spend time singing together. Um, you know, every time we gather together, we worship and we sing because what happens, it begins to lift our eyes off ourselves and it begins to put our eyes on God. And what an amazing change takes place. And suddenly for David, there began to be some light in the middle of the darkness. Well, I got to tell you what happened that time years ago. Uh, my brothers had turned the lights out and I felt so alone there in the darkness of the cave. And I remember those walls fill- closing in. But I took a minute and I kind of gathered myself and, and I began to, to inch forward. And every once in a while they'd give me a little flicker of light or maybe a shout. So I knew I was kind of going in the right direction, but I wasn't sure. But I just kept inching forward and I kept inching forward. And eventually up ahead, I could see that there was a little bit of light. And so I kept moving towards that light. I kept moving towards the light. And then the light got bigger. And then suddenly there were some shadows. And suddenly there we were. And we came out. And we were on the other side. And I came to realize as we moved from the darkness into the light that all along that cave that I was in, it wasn't a cave. It was a tunnel. And we had come out on the other side. And can I say that again for you? It wasn't a cave, it was a tunnel. And whatever you face today, whatever you face someday in the future, God is on the other side, arms wide open, shining a light that says, keep inching forward, keep moving forward. And eventually you may find that this cave that you think you're in, you are coming out of it on the other side. Inch forward on your face, crying out, and then onto your knees saying, God, you are my refuge. Standing onto your feet, lifting your eyes in worship and saying, God, you are the one alone who is worthy of praise. In fact, think about this. Jesus, by his death and his resurrection, once and for all, proved this to be true. Because when he was buried, where did they put him? They put him in a, a tomb is the word. But really what it was, was a cave. They put, they, they put uh, Jesus in a cave. And three days later, he came out. And he turned that cave into one of the greatest images of hope that there is. An empty tomb. And that's the hope that we can still walk in today. That's not to say that we're never going to go through our stuff. We're never going to be in our cave times. But what it says is that there is a God on the other side with arms reached out to you saying, keep inching forward, keep going towards the light, and you're going to get to the other side, and you're going to hear me say, well done.